Jigaboos and wannabes, light-skinned versus dark-skinned blacks. It's the sensitive issue brought up in Spike Lee's new movie, School Days. We'll talk about the internal discrimination in the black community today on Time Out. It's Time Out with Bill Bond. Well, I welcome you, everybody, and let's face it, this is a sensitive issue, and all discrimination, no matter where it comes from, is bad. But let's try to find out more about the subject. According to sociologists for a long time, and the latest Spike Lee movie, a form of prejudice exists in the black community based on skin color. Now, with me right now, I have two black women. Tanya, right, you are obviously a light-skinned black, uh -huh. right? You go to the University of Pennsylvania. How old are you? I'm 20. 20. At this point in your life, what kind of, if any, prejudice have you experienced from the black community because mm -hmm. of your skin tone? Well, I've received some, uh, experienced some hostility and resentment from dark-skinned black women uh, because I was light-skinned. How does it manifest itself? What do you hear? Uh, well, it begins when I walk down the street with my boyfriend, who is black. I receive a lot of uh, evil looks and stares with him, and I think a lot of them think that I am white and they don't appreciate that. And I've been accused by a lot of black women of stealing their boyfriends who supposedly only wanted me because I was light-skinned and had good hair. So I've experienced that Now, when too. you use the term, and this is in Spike Lee's movie, there's a whole thing about hair, and I just mentioned the term jig what is it? Jigaboo. Jig what, what's a jigaboo? A jigaboo is anyone who's dark-skinned and has an Afro and natural hair, black features, anything that is not white. Now, who made that term up? I think it begins way back in slavery. All right, and what about wannabes? Wannabes are, that term comes from wannabe white, uh -huh. and that's light-skinned black people with right. good hair and good features, features that are predominantly white features. Uh, w w which category are you in? If I would be a wannabe. You would be a wannabe based on the way you look, or right. what about your attitude? I identify more with, I'm interracial, yeah. and I identify more with my black heritage right. than with my white heritage, but because of the way I look, I would be termed as a wannabe. All right, now just stay right there, Tanya. Also with us, we have Pam. Hi, Pam. Hi, how are you? Uh, you are obviously a darker-skinned black woman. Yes, I have the same question for you. Mm -hmm. What kind of, if any, prejudice have you experienced uh, within the black community based on your skin tone? Well, um, as a black canvasser, last summer I met most of my resistance from lighter-skinned black people when I went to their doors. Um, more or less they asked, or they looked at you like, well, what are you doing here? And it was a really bad attitude, and I think that's where a lot of my problems came going to those doors. To, to, to the lighter skin mm -hmm. black people? Okay. Yes. All right, now, so just, you'll be with us for the entire show. Let me move on and introduce you to some of our guests, right? This is Lisa Jones. Lisa Jones, together with Spike Lee, co-authored the book Uplift the Race, The Construction of School Days. Now, this is a book about the making of the movie. And so I guess the question, Lisa, is why was it important? for this to be a component of a Spike Lee film. It's not the only thing the movie's about, but why, was it a comp why is this an important component of the film? Well, I think for Spike, because it's a question that um, elders in our community always say, you know, keep in the closet, that for him it was, you know, an ideal subject because it was controversial. To bring it out of the closet? What about those people who are saying, all Spike Lee did is take a private subject out, it's like airing the black community's dirty linen in public. We don't need this. Valid well, I, point? I think that's all the more reason that we do need it, because it is in the closet, and we need to talk about it. I mean, you don't keep your dirty laundry in the closet, or else it, you know, stinks up the closet. All right, also with us is Edward Lawson. Now, you may remember this gentleman as the California Walkman in the mid-'70s. He enjoyed walking the wealthy streets of San Diego, and there, in a matter of 22 months, he was stopped by the police 15 times just for walking around. When they asked him to produce his ID, he refused, and he was arrested. That led to a lawsuit which ended with the Supreme Court striking down the California law that required people to pr uh, produce proper identification when they're simply walking down the streets. And he now heads an organization called Proper Inc. to help uh, people represent themselves in the law and the media. Now, Edward, you, you've made a statement that you feel that this form of discrimination we're talking about right now based on skin color is, we'll say, more in the closet than incest in the black community. That's a big statement. Well, I think that that is a, perhaps agreeing with you, a big statement. I think also it is a true statement. Let me go on to make this observation uh, also. In responding to your initial notion about discrimination between blacks well, who well, are dark... Well, my question uh, is about that, whether okay, or not it exists. Question, uh, yeah. dealing with discrimination, uh, uh, light-skinned blacks versus dark-skinned blacks. 
I think that if you look at this in uh, the sense of where it all came from, where it all started, what you are looking at is simply different kinds of black people who are literally the victims of discrimination by the larger European society. If you go back to all of our origins, all of those of us who are black, whether you're light-skinned or dark-skinned, you're talking about slavery, which is a very interesting thing because if you deal much with much of the bourgeois black community right now, uh, you find there's this sort of uh, calculated program to deny the fact that we originated from slavery, to deny the fact that probably the most pervasive factor in black Americans today is slavery. I talked to my grandfather. My grandfather talked to slaves. Slavery is not something that happened a thousand years ago. It's a very crucial element of today's right. black society. Right. The thing that is important to understand is that the institution of slavery did not simply take somebody from Africa and three minutes later you were employed as a slave. The institution of slavery was a form of brainwashing that took years and years and years to make a slave. And one of the things that the Europeans taught them was to hate what you were were to assume that the more of yourself that you were, the lesser you were as a human being. And the other thing that the Europeans taught them was that if you were European, you were right, you were God, you were better. Therefore, the more European in you, the better human being that you are. So what you see today in the black community, in the uh, movie that Spike Lee has just uh, dealt with, is the residual component of slavery. Those of us who are black and are European simply discriminating against those of us who are black and black. Uh, extremely articulate point. I thank you. And we'll be hearing, obviously, from more, more of you from later in the show. Also with us today is Mickey Garth Taylor. She is the beauty and the cover editor of this magazine. This is Essence Magazine. This is a black woman's magazine. Mickey, it's your job to choose, basically, who represents the concept of black beauty. Do you have a preference in skin tone? We do, in the fact that we get them all. Our covers must mirror our readers, and so we look to light-skinned women with straight hair. We look to dark-skinned women with natural hair. We look to women with full and flowery features. We look to women with king features, and they may also have kinky hair. It's a job that we embraced 12 months a year to mirror that reader on our cover. All right, so all you say you go in you. all directions. I'll see whether or not some of your readers agree. Also with us is Dr. Robert Millett. He is head of the sociology department at Lincoln University, and your doctoral thesis, in a way, and dealt with this subject. Give us your opinion of how operative is this form of prejudice in the black community today, blacks against blacks. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in order for me to respond to you and to respond to you well, I think we need to take a look at not necessarily what goes on on a daily basis in the black community. But I think and I hope that this forum today is going to address that. It's also going to take a very close look, a very hard look, at what goes on in the white community. Well, I guess we can't. We're trying to separate it, but I suppose it is difficult to separate. Very you difficult. know what I'd like to do? Because this is, I know what evolved. We had a promo that we had to pull off the air yesterday when we were just simply, when I was saying on a promo, blacks versus black, a question of discrimination in the black community. We got so many calls that literally we had to take this thing off the air. So I know I'm dealing with a volatile subject. I want to go back to the audience just for a little while here and just get some of their reactions to it. And, and, well, let, me, and, let me make this point. Uh, it's right, interesting. There's a lack of courage on your part in taking the promo off the air. What you were probably hearing is from those of us who are black and who have a sense of guilt. Those of us who are black and would rather have this issue stay in the closet yeah. because either one, we have perpetuated it, or two, we have profited by it. So I think that it is right. to be said very clearly from the fact that you got so many people who cried out Wild in pain up. of guilt that it's obviously an issue that right. is there. Well, we, the fact we didn't cancel the show, we're going to talk about it right now. I'm going to go to maybe a couple of older black people in the audience, if that's okay. Hi. Hi. What's your, would you mind standing up? You no. comfortable? Okay, what's your name? Catherine McCabe. Catherine, what do you think about this subject <clears throat> of discrimination in the black community based on skin tone? I agree in part with... Uh, two of the speakers, Mr. Lawson and Dr. Millett, and uh, say that it was even emphasized in the community of bondage in which our people lived when children of the owner of the plantation mm -hmm. became a part of the oppressed plantation. They were treated better, and they looked different, and in time they benefited more. Be be simply because they looked, say, more white. I mean, yes. this is a complex... Yeah. The psycho 
historical issue we're dealing yes. here with the psychological their fathers impact. saw to it that they got right. benefits they were allowed to work at the least strenuous jobs they were given the chance to learn and um, perhaps in a moment of conscience they were left right. benefits As property result, right. or money well, what, and so the the uh, slaves who were or I prefer to say those in bondage who had come from a foreign land learned to resent them it was taught. It seems perfectly understandable. Yeah. We'll go about, one more point on that, ahead, what, just taking what she has said there. You understand that what she is suggesting even went further. It was instituted in law. You understand that the majority of you who are light-skinned, or the majority of us who have white blood in us, which is some 70 to 80 percent of every man, woman, and child who is black has some kind of European blood in them. Conversely, interestingly enough, every uh, one in five, 20 percent of those of you who are white have some black blood in you. So this may not be all about just but, us. But you understand that as a matter of law, that those of us who are possessing white blood came by it primarily through the simple act of rape. Those of us who are mixed blood and who are extremely proud of our European ancestry are the proud victims of rape. You understand that this particular pattern of rape went on decade after decade after decade. It became so much a standard part of the lifestyle of the Old South that it was represented in law to the extent that those slaves who were half white upon the death of the master would be set free in his will. Those slaves who were half white upon the age of majority, 18 years old or whatever it was at the time, were set free. And then additionally, you had virtually every major so-called black university have its origin from the fact that guilt-ridden masters wanted to provide education for their half white right. children. That All is right. the origin of much of what you see today. All right, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, I used to be a sociology major when I was in college, and I can see why it helped prepare me for my job today. This is an interesting show. I want you to stay right with us. We're going to come back and maybe talk a little bit more about the concept of black beauty and hear from a lot of people in our audience. We have uh, some very light-skinned black people in the audience and dark-skinned black people, and we're going to try to investigate and understand this subject, and maybe as a result of what we're doing, a little bit of it will go away. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Michael Jackson making himself whiter? Do you think we just had four pictures of Michael Jackson? Is this, is this an important question to us address, or should we push this aside and move on? To well, it's, probably, it's, an, it's a vital question for us to address, first of all. The answer is unequivocally uh, yes. And then the, third, the second answer is, uh, I am not Michael, and I would feel a little reluctant to speak for him. Let me make this observation that for a long, long time, going all the way back, I can remember to Brother James Brown, one of the marks of the fact that you were a successful Negro was that you could get your hair combed. Indeed. that you could get your hair combed. Indeed. And that is tantamount to saying that you had white hair. You had finally arrived. You had white hair. If you turn, and this is, I remember, as, a, as I said before, as a, as a little Negro, I remember one of my first impressions was my mother got what is called Ebony Magazine, for those of you who are white, <laughs> and those of you who are passing. <laughs> the entire back section of Ebony Magazine, which for the longest time was the only black magazine, was literally thick and dripping with bleaching creams. Mm. And all of those advertisements, which were not bleaching clean, creams, were some form of concholine, as it used to be called before, uh, before it became... Uh, Relaxes. Was it called? Relaxes. It's either Jerry Curl or Mobile Oil. I can't remember which they're using now. <laughs> but the point is that literally the mark of success for those of us who were black performers, who fought our way out of the ghetto, for centuries, when that was the only way out, 
the first indication that you had arrived was your skin got lighter, your women got much lighter, and your hair straightened out. So uh, uh, our dear friend uh, Michael, for whom I won't attempt to say whether, you know, what he's doing to himself, he is only one chapter in a book that goes all the way back to when we got here. We're getting a history lesson from you. You're, you're something. Uh, let me go to uh, Mickey Garth Taylor, right? Mickey, we've got some photos here. You can check out our monitor right down there. Take a look at them. These are some photos of Essence Magazine, some of your ideas of black beauty, okay? Just tell us anything at all about, the, about these women or nothing, if you want. Well, if you notice from these women that you have on the screen, first of all, they are of different complexions. They are of different features, different hair types. You're going to see, you'll see kinky hair, you'll see straight hair, you'll see hair that has a natural curl that hasn't been processed. And what's most interesting that I would like to say, because I heard someone say earlier about good and bad hair, there is no good and bad right, hair. Right, I caught that. I hair saying. is only bad if it's out of control, in poor condition. Hair is good if it's well taken care of. There is no standard that says that straight hair or hair that has a relaxed curl pattern is good hair or that hair that has a tight, kinky curl pattern is bad hair. I mean, it's, it sounds like the movie, the good, bad, and ugly. What is it? <laughs> All right, let's, let's get some reactions from some of our guests. Hi, Hi. welcome. You, you are a very light-skinned woman. Yes. How has this affected your life? What have, what have you felt from the black community? My first recollection that I was different was when I was about in the ninth grade in a public school, and I was followed home by about 50 darker-skinned children, and they were calling me Vanilla Bean. And I, but I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. I thought they meant the Popeye character, Vanellope. Uh. And they kept saying Vanellope, you know? <laughs> and, um, uh, well, my mother resolved that problem. And after that, I became friends with these students. But uh, later on, um, it seemed to be an asset for me to be light-skinned as far as getting a job. I'm 49 now, so um, I haven't had any problems. Being lighter has uh, been helpful it, it has helped you. Would, you. would you say that the, the question of black uh, color consciousness is escalating, or is it pretty much is it declining? Is it pretty much staying where it's well, been? Well, the main your... thing that I liked is the fact that black is beautiful came out. Then I remember... Well, how I did was... you feel during that, though? Being well, a, a, I, a very light-skinned black at that point. Oh, at that time, then I got my afro, and it made me, it made me feel proud to be a black person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that. Now, when I saw the movie uh, with Spike Lee, I was very disappointed because it showed such a negative... The negative... The negative what? side. The raunchiness. You didn't like that. The raunchiness, the sex, the she violence. Like that stuff. <laughs> All right, let me go to somebody else. Hi, would you stand up, please? What, what do you think about this subject? Um, well... you have any opinion? Is it, is it something that's uh, comfortable for you to talk about? I like the show. You like the show, but we're not going to get any profound sociological insight from you. Okay. Who else wants to give me an opinion here? What do you think, young man? Yeah, stand up. Oh, well, I was going to say, as far as good hair and bad hair is concerned, it, in reality, is not true. But when you are growing up with your friends, if you have your natural hair or whatever, and you see all of our friends with their perms and everything, you want one, you want to be long. And, and when you're young and you have maybe a ponytail or whatever, and your hair is out, the kids, kids will laugh at you, they pick fun with you or whatever, and you just want to be long because everyone else has the straight hair. I mean, at, kids can be cruel when they're young, and you, as a kid, you want to be, be long, and as you get older, you still want the um, straight hair if you, you know, uh, if you don't. You know, unfortunately, that problem doesn't lie with the children. Yes, they can be cruel, but that problem goes back in the home to the parents who should have encouraged that your hair is beautiful the way it is and that there's no quote-unquote belong. Whether I, your hair is straight or I, whether it's kinky, it's still beautiful hair, and you don't have to join a group or be in to, you know, to right. be a part of Go it. Go ahead, Dr. Let, let, let me again, let me agree with you, but at the same time shed some new light, if you will. It's, we, we, we are focusing on the, the black community, as if the problem exists only in the black community. The, the, the argument that I am making that, is that the problem does not exist in the black community. Does the not problem exist. exists. The problem of being light-skinned and the, the, the advantages of being a light-skinned person comes from the larger society. Mm -hmm. The larger society says to us that if you're going to make it, if you're going to success, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to become a politician, a successful politician, then these are 
the keys. All right, here's it. Let's get a real. Let me respond to that, if I may, just for a second. Well, I've got right. I, I had somebody lighter than you who wants to respond here. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Then I'll, I'll go right to you. But let's hear from you. I just want to say that while there are many benefits to being light skinned, I have experienced a lot of downfalls too. That. Um, within the black community. Yeah, within yeah. the black community. That while I think the majority of black men that I know have a preference much more for light skinned black women than they do for dark skinned black women, but that I also feel. But I've experienced a lot of negative aspects of it because many black men only like me because of my light skin and my good hair and my white features and not for who I am. So it, in many ways it becomes a hindrance because they don't like me for who I am, they like me because of the way I look mm. and because it's almost, it's almost like um, a social status for many black men to be with light skinned women. All right, now I wanted to go to this because we were talking about women. Excuse me for interrupting, but go ahead. Now the point that I would make is that since you were uh, interested in, in that particular insight is to make this observation. Surely, as black people, our hearts go out to anyone who has ever suffered anything in terms of discrimination. We've experienced too much of it to be cold to uh, the sufferings of anyone else, white, black, yellow, what have you. But I think the thing to understand here is that whatever personal disadvantages being light-skinned have brought you, they are enormously minuscule in proportion to the whole panacea of opportunities that are made available to you. That's that is not your fault. You did not do that. I agree with the, this gentleman in that respect. But at the same time, there's a very vested interest if you benefit from that condition for you to either one, sort of just sit on the sidelines and do nothing about it, or two, as we see in so many light-skinned black organizations, to actually get in there and work for the master because you did not create the situation, but you do benefit from it. Mm -hmm. The second thing I'd like to say is I would like to, as you said, agree and disagree with you in this respect. As I said, you are as you sit here. We, as we sit here, are slaves. That is the most prominent feature in black reality. We did not create this discrimination among us. I agree with you in that regard. But I disagree in that it is within our control to stop it. If you believe that you can wait for the European society to come into our community to make anything better, then may I suggest you are in for a long wait. And the third point I would like to make in response to this lady up here. <laughs> the problem that you highlight in terms of the image that children have of themselves is, even goes further. I think this is fascinating. I think you begin a very exciting point here. Let's say that you're 12 years old and you are jet black. <laughs> And of course, if you read Jet Magazine and you look at the advertisements in there, we don't really mean Jet Black. If you are a black youngster and you start to, for instance, go through all the popular magazines, you won't see any black people in there. Fascinating thing when you talk about magazines. Let's talk about Time Magazine. You have that ad that we finally got after all the campaigns in the 60s. We finally got uh, Time Magazine or Newsweek to stop their bigoted ads and actually include black people. So you have like everybody's lounging around in this ad doing dungarees ads. And you have the white kid there, and of course the white kid has perfectly blonde eyes and blue hair. I mean, and all white people don't look like that, but he's the model, he's the epitome of white people. Right. You have the Chinese kid there, he looks like he descended directly from the Ming Dynasty, didn't even stop at customs. <laughs> then you have this other youngster here who is obviously white with a little bit of black blood in him. And if you are this, 12-year-old black, black youngster, you look no. at time and you say, where am I? I don't exist. No. 400 years after we got here, 100 years after the Civil War, a good 20 years after the black is beautiful, that black child is still Ralph Ellison's invisible man. If he looks right. into Ebony magazine, if he looks into any of the black publications, it's worse. It's the same white person who has a tiny little bit of black blood in him. So he sees himself right. nowhere and he has a built-in vested he has built-in sense of discrimination against himself. I'm not anywhere. I'm no good. I'm lesser. I and, can become and, more white. And it continues, and, and, and hence, in, in, in what you've just described us, we can understand some of the nature of the prejudice that can exist in that little boy's head, potential, potentially. Well, I'm agreeing with this yeah. gentleman, and you understand that that sure. kid is being victimized, first of all, by the larger European culture, and then yeah. those among us who are half-white exist as a Trojan horse within the black community perpetuating this fight. Everywhere he sees... I have to take a break, Edward. we got a lot of points that want to be made here, and we'll be back and continue to take some phone calls right after this. We'll be right back.
you may be passing for white, baby, but you ain't invisible. Woman attempting to pass there. Uh, we, we can, there's so many different places we can jump in. I, I want to get back into the hair point. What is this thing with so-called good hair? Actually, what, bad what, hair. Here's the what, thing that's what, wait, no, wait. Hey, well, let, me, let me hear from the ones over here with the hair. You're, you're making quite a hair statement yourself, right? Mm -hmm. right, right Actually, right. I'm not. This is what all of their hair looks like if they did not spend hours in the part wait of the Wait a second. It took a long time to out. make your hair like that, too. Yeah, but what, what's good hair, what's bad hair? Why the term good and bad? Well, the straighter the better, so to say. Is that, that's is that what you think? No, I don't think so, personally. Why but not? But that's what we've been programmed to think by the white people, right. they by the Europeans. Well, what does Essence Magazine say yeah. about this? So well, why are we buying it? Why are we still carrying it on? I mean, when were we programmed? Was it programmed in, in 1890? Was it programmed in 1920? Why are we still carrying right. that around? Hair points Essence, right over here. Essence, in let's fact, hear, let's hear gives it. you all kinds of hair and all kinds of hairstyles, all kinds of looks. I don't new agree that, that Essence boys. Magazine truly reflects the diversity in the black community. I really think that it does portray a more European image of black women in that magazine. You and don't why do you find, say that? Why do I? Because I read it every month because it's for today's I mean, black women. What do you see on our pages that makes you say that consistently? The pictures of the black women. Yes, you do get a variety of colors, but they tend more towards the European features as opposed to the African features. Well, well, well you, you have fairly European features yourself. Uh, not my fault. You know, no, 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 it's funny. I'm trying but to I'm saying she also recognizes yeah. that her future, she cannot join the white race that the white race will never accept her for whoever she is until she and we accept black people as being something positive. And I think also this point, going back to my analogy about the multiracial ad with the white person and yeah. the Chinese person, the white person is a model of whiteness. You don't think all these people look like white models. The thing is, when you get to the black person, the black person is not a model of blackness. It's a model of either half blackness or of whiteness with a little bit of blackness in it. The models that are white models have perfect blue eyes, perfect blonde hair. The models that are black, if you are going to join the black race, should be pitch black. All right, know this. We got everybody here has an opinion here. Go ahead. I think the bottom line issue we're dealing with is inferiority of the black race. We have been conditioned and taught to hate ourselves. We see it in our skin color. We see it in what we try to do with our hair. We see it in the contact lenses. You see a very dark-skinned person wearing light blue or light with blue eyes because they're contact yeah. lenses. Right. You see black people getting their hair straightened. You see black people wanting to be lighter. And what you have here is you have light-skinned blacks and dark-skinned blacks, and the light-skinned blacks are thinking they're better than the dark-skinned blacks. That must mean that they don't think they're as good as white people. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom mm -hmm. line. And you know, I, I like point. to that's Excellent point. That's the, uh, excellent point. Yeah, well, that's the, and that's the point I was trying to I make. Know. We have to look at the larger society. We have to look at the values. We have to look at the norms. We have to look at the, the patterns of behaviors. And those patterns exist. But we well, well, what do we do about it? If you excuse me, I, yeah, I, I want to go back to Lisa. Because, go ahead, Lisa, your point, then I have a question. the fact that we as blacks perpetuate it within our community. One thing I had mentioned to, to Mickey was um, in the last five years, I've noticed that more of the covers of Essence magazine have been lighter-skinned women. She disagrees with me. Indeed. Be it's interesting because I hear from lighter-skinned women that all you portray are dark-skinned women with natural hair and full noses or full lips. I hear the exact opposite. How could both be true? And certainly at Essence, we have an Im important duty, a purposeful duty, to mirror everyone. And that's a tremendous I job. I heard an interesting rumor that uh, covers with lighter skinned women tend to sell better. No, in and fact, they don't. And that was one don't. of the reasons why they don't. And it, a few years ago, we ran a cover of a very fair skinned woman with gray eyes. And there was outrageous complaints. You went letters, too far, letters, probably. That, oh, yes, uh, but also, there was a time period in the history of Essence where covers of dark women did not sell. Tell me why, Essence readers. Oh, For a period of about five years, dark skinned women on the cover. Those covers did not sell. What, he, what years were those? 1975 to about 1980. Yeah, but one of the top models, models at that point was Naomi Sims, who was a very dark skinned model. Right? Yes. She was quite the exception at that point. But I understand not... here again the point that I am making is this. Let me take you one more time back to my analogy about the multiracial ads. Why is it when white people model white people, it is the whitest person? Why is it when Chinese model a Chinese person, it's the Chineseiest person? 
Why is it when black people model so-called black people, it's either the lightest or somebody in the middle? Why don't we model not the average black person, but what we as a people believe to be yeah. the epitome, the essence of blackness? I don't think your responsibility in terms of your magazine is to model the full spectrum of black people, the same way you don't find the full spectrum of white people in Vogue or Madame Bazelle. Right. It's a question to create the model, what we right. aspire to, where we think we are going as a race of people. And so long as that aspiration represents a model of a person who is predominantly white with a little bit of black blood in it, we will continue right. as children to question our blackness, as adults to despise our blackness. All right, let me get, let me get back into the audience for a second, because everybody seems to have a question here. Hi, stand up. Hi. I don't know what you are. <laughs> You, you are whatever you want to be, as far as I'm concerned. Well, you're all right, whatever you are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right, exactly. Maybe, maybe better what's your, than all what's right. your question? Well, I just want to say that no matter what color it is, it's what sells. You said that uh, when you're black, it didn't sell in that period of time. Well, with models, I mean, it's what you look for, the features, the face, what you want to try to sell. It doesn't matter what color you are, but if the people right. aren't buying it, they, I mean... Yeah, but th there's an implicit no. here is no, no, the no, question. No, but no. there's something implicit here, and that's the question that Essence Magazine, the magazine for the black women, has a social responsibility to address this question, or does it not? I mean, Spike Lee addressed this question. Have you ever really addressed this question? Yes, we have. Several times, brilliant writers such as Alice Walker, Bonnie Allen, Alexis DeVoe have addressed the subject right. of color for years, I, I, over and okay. over again. I have another question. Is the essence of what we're talking about here women? We really are just basically talking about women's hair today and women's skin tone. No, it's just no, both it's Right, both. it goes both ways, but we're yes. just focusing on women. And I think something odd, a small credit should be made in that she is here from essence to openly discuss this. Yeah. That right. is a credit on her part. If you were to look at the majority of our so-called black magazines, they, there is no one on the face of the earth who has been more guilty historically in denigrating the blackness of black people than the okay. Ebony's, than Pants. the Jets, than the long list of so-called black publications. Sir, they will not address the question. We'll give you the senior status here in the audience today. What do you have to say? I, I perhaps will not be speaking directly to your question because my experience has not been black against black, but white against black. Mm -hmm. And while I have had fairly good success in the business world, I find that when any black person aspires to reach the top, the, everybody converges on you and tries to stop your progress. And that's what's wrong. From the white community. From the white community. They want to, want to hold uh, you. They want, want to, to have a token, but they don't want you to go so high. All right. And uh, in the, even in the federal government, Especially there has the always government. existed that prejudice, and it's still there. All right, I'm going to take a break, come back, and get as many hands in the next segment as, as possible, including a redhead over there. We'll be back right after this. I want to say to the credit of our audience, it's been a long time since we've done a show where virtually everybody wants to say something. I think that something's coming out here, and that's good. And what do you want to say? I'd like to say I'm from a family of seven children, and even though there was love and unity always projected inside the family, there was one sister that was darker than anyone else in, in the sibling, and she resented that from birth. And as uh, someone right. was saying there, it, it was obviously inherit she hated me so much being the oldest and lighter than her until she actually gave me a black eye one day for no other reason than that got the point and I, that underscores what we're talking about hi yeah yes i'd this like to say that um my father is light skin my mother is dark skin my brother is light skin with green eyes and here i am there is thank god no problems in our family as far as a prejudice right. if we got in trouble we got in trouble Okay. There were no prejudices uh, on either side of the family. So what, but did it? you see that sort of thing around you? In other words, your particular example of a family is not the whole world. Did you see that sort of thing around you? No, not the whole world. I'm, I just feel that I'm blessed. That Wait a minute. That You're not blessed with a microphone, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Stand back up. I know that that is a problem in the society, but I'm just saying with my family that there was not a problem, right. and okay. I thank God that it's there is a point. Right. Right. Let me jump back over here. Hi. You had a, a question. Yeah. This is, here's, one, here's one of those home run type questions. Right? The ball comes in. 
It slides up to the guest. The guest swings the bat and says... We've, we've not heard much from the white members of the audience. I'd like to know, why do white people get suntans? Host oh, takes wow. microphone and goes over to... Who would like to answer that? Now, you're not a white person. Who wants to, who wants to say why white people like to get suntans? I, I can answer the question. I'm actually... No, wait a second. I'm in here. I know. I know I what I, I, I do. Could be. You I, understand I could be. I look better. But, but no, not, I didn't, let's vote on that, whether he looks better or I look no, better. No, 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 no. <laughs> when I get a suntan, I think I look better. No, I, go ahead. Ask I, somebody who right. No, here's my redhead. Bad. Oh, yeah, hi. Hi. I'm going to a tanning bed right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm going to a tanning bed right now to get a suntan in the middle of the winter. Just because it makes me look healthier. I get a glow in my cheeks, and I just look darker. I, I feel that I look healthier and prettier. No, that's that. that may, but I never even thought of that. It never came to my mind to be black or to not be black. I mean, how can you get that? Well, let me, let, all right. let, let me come over here. Me. Could I say one tiny thing? <laughs> keep Edward, keep it tiny. small because I'm trying to get these folks on. Okay, go ahead. Let, let's let her speak. I just want to say that while we're sitting here talking about lights, that light skin is preferred and more desired, I have a lot of dark skin friends who would not trade their skin color for my skin color any day. Yeah. And then I know a lot of light skin girls who want to marry very dark skin men because they want their children to have some color. Yeah. And I think that at this day and age in the late 80s, that while the color of the skin is more accepted in the different range from light skin to dark skin, that the features, the whiter the features, the better the hair. That stereotype is still prevalent, yeah, but that right. the color is more accepted, and the light skin is not necessarily better and more desired. All right, now you had some other point over here? Yeah, wait. Um, I spoke to you early on. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Tracy, and I'm a student from Camden High School. Uh, it, Camden High School is an all-black school, and I can remember when I used to live in California, and I used to go to an all-white school, and I was very little, and I was the only black child there. And I remember after taking a swimming class, all the white kids had came up to me and said, Wow, what's, what's, that, what's that in your hair? Why is it so curly and all that? And, you know, I had always felt a little bit different, and then I didn't understand, and I always had wish. I said, Wow, I wish I had straighter hair or something, mm -hmm. because I was the only one that was different. But now, you know, I can't accept who I am, and I am very proud to be black. Well, let me ask you one question about that. All right. It's good to be proud of whatever you are, for sure. But you are extremely light-skinned. Why do you feel that you're a black person when you're as light-skinned as you are? Because I'm her mother, and I put her black. <laughs> 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 That's the answer. That's the mother, and I put her black pride, and beauty comes from within. It's not what's on the outside, but the beauty must come from within. Got it. And that's what we need more of in the home. Yeah. That's where it begins. All right, I got to get that redhead. I said we have a redhead, and I meant I stand up and jump over this way. Yeah, what's your name? Joe. Joe. Joe, blue eyes, red hair. What's your question, buddy? Um, Well, I'd like to bring up a point that b before it was brought up about Essence magazine, how there's more uh, European-looking women on the covers and things like that. But you can't really blame... Um, it's Garth Taylor, or you can't really blame the magazine, it's the public, because the magazine is a business. The magazine was not formed to deal with these issues, it was formed to make money. And if the public will pay for a light-skinned woman on the cover, well, that's the public's prerogative. Well, that's they can the do same point as this made over there. Uh, do you anything you want to add? I have a point. Well, see, I'm black. Like, I know you're not black. Yay, let's hear it. Yeah. And I consider, you know, black people are black people. There's no discrimination, you know, from where I live at, my community. Do you, do you have any preference in terms of skin tone with women? Well, right now, uh, yes, I do go out with a light-skinned, you know, young lady. She is light-skinned, light-skinned black. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't have any preference. I've gone out with darker-skinned women. I've gone out with light-skinned girls. You know, right. it doesn't make a difference to me. All right. I, wanna, I, wanna I would get back like to, to respond to the gentleman's ahead. point. It, goes, it does go beyond what sells. You can look at other magazines such as Glamour, Vogue, and Bazaar, and they do go for what sells. Certainly, Beverly Johnson has been the darkest Vogue cover model ever. Iman has never had a Vogue cover or a Bazaar cover. At Essence, you're going to see all complexions. It does go... To back to the point of us mirroring ourselves right. on that cover, on those pages. Right. And you know, it is a duty. It is a duty because we are a magazine for today's black woman for her. Not just a question of selling to right. her or selling to any reader. For today's black woman. I'd like to go back to, let me go to Lisa Jones for a second. And I, 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 I want you to tell Spike Lee that I said this. I, we wouldn't be doing this show if it wasn't for your movie. I mean, we do a lot of topics, but you put the, the idea in mm -hmm. our head. But however, you had some difficulties within the concept of, of, of incorporating this into making the movie, got thrown off a campus and so forth. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. 
Well, I think one interesting thing that happened on location is that um, the cast members, the wannabes and the jigaboos, were divided <coughs> in hotels to sort of really emphasize the conflict that was going to be brought to life on screen. And some real life tension resulted mm -hmm. because of that. You know, I happened to be in the quote unquote jigaboo hotel as a crew member and um, just talking to the actresses, you know, about it. And also these black actresses, brown skinned women, were without their male counterparts at this hotel. So they really felt, you know, Isolated? Yeah, isolated. And, and, and I think it really mirrored what happened in society. You know, what happens. Continue. All right, let me take a break. We'll come back. And if there's any possible conclusions that can be drawn somehow, we will attempt to draw them right up to this. I'm going to try to draw some conclusions here, but here's a woman I think from a personal standpoint has a quick, interesting comment. Yes, I, I would like to make a point on the magazine essence. Every time we're in the magazine, you have for the European look, the light, light-skinned female with the long hair, <laughs> the brown eyes. And when we look for the Afro, we have the jet black one with the kinky hair. Where does the brown skin come in? The controversy is just the light, light skin and the dark, dark skin. Where does the brown skin fit right. in? I'm sorry you missed us. She's been right in there. <laughs> All right, now here's a young white fellow here on the end with a question, too. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you're blaming the problem in the black community on the white attitudes towards the blacks, because that's what it sounds like Well, that's to me. what Dr. Millette said early on, that it's got to be taken in its context, well, correct? I, wait, wait a minute, did you I, finish his question? Yeah. But, that was it. What I'm doing is not, not necessarily passing blame, necessarily, but simply looking at the situation as it exists. It's a political situation. The politics involved. The whole notion of divide and rule is involved. Then there is the question of economics is involved. The lighter you are, the more you, the more you emulate mm -hmm. the white master, the, in quotes, the better you are. So these things must be taken into consideration. Let me okay. also make this point, if I may. Sir, do you, I assume you're a student at some juncture, have you studied American history? Slightly. Have you studied slavery? Yes. Do you understand if I were to give you a current example of slavery, what I would do with you is if a spaceship lands, someone takes you to a planet where there are nothing but green people. They take you away from your mother, your father, all of these institutions. It took at least three years to make a slave a slave. For the next three years, green people are going to tell you, you're no good, white is a horrible looking color, not having zinc bob wire hair is disgusting. Now, let me ask you this, after 400 years of that, what do you think your reaction would be when you saw a white person uh, either in the audience or in a magazine? The microphone isn't on. What I've got from today's discussion is that you're saying your actions are based upon how we react to no, you. No, I am asking you what would your reaction right now be after having been held in captive 400 years by green people? What would you think of being white now, right now? No, that's, he, he, he speaks for himself. <laughs> he would? I'm okay, still, fine. I'm that's still the white. The question. That's I'm still yeah. white. White is white and black is black. No, that's not the question, I'm... sir. The question is, if you for 400 years had been on the planet Mars with green people... Being told that white was no good. ...over and over that's again. That's what he doesn't being get. Being white is no good. That's what he didn't if get. If they had killed you, if you'd stood up and said, being white is all right if they killed generations of you for standing up and saying being white is all right. I ask you today, what would you think of being white? Am I supposed to say that I don't like my heritage? No, you're supposed no, to speak right. the truth. No, I want to drop, hold it. I got to drop this. You're not connecting. You two are not communicating. Uh, no, I tell you, I, how much time do I have, Bill? About three minutes or so? Three minutes left. I want to see if we can get some conclusions. Conclusions. Is that a conclusion or a question? I have a conclusion. All right, a conclusion. You began it, yes. and you'll begin the conclusions. Go ahead. As Pam. James Baldwin said, he said that if a people is, are taught something long enough and effectively enough, they become, they start to believe in that. And that's exactly what has happened in the black community. We've been taught that darker is bad, and we've started to believe it. It's now up to us to start to break right. that and start believing that we are good right. no matter if we're light or dark. Now, Lisa, I have one minute, 30, one minute, 90 seconds. Lisa, add something to this. 
Where do we have to go from here? I, I agree exactly, and I think um, school days is part of that. Part I of think it, it doesn't include, conclude that light is better or dark right. is better. It's just we're all beautiful. Edward, one step, very briefly, one step that we can take from today's show. Anybody watching, one step. I think one step is, again, uh, the sort of thing she's talking about. The politicians are corrupt. The business people are corrupt. Artists are independent, and they can, and they are, and they always have been the leadership in these questions. Good. Okay. Mickey, go ahead. Indeed. Go on. We do have to face the issue, drop the excess baggage, embrace all of ourselves as beautiful. That's the launching pad. I, I tend to agree with that, uh, but to, to, to go beyond that, I think we, we also need to take, as a sociologist, I think we, we, we need to take a look and educate our young people as to the larger picture, the politics involved, the economics involved, the, 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 the notion of divide and rule mm -hmm. involved, uh, the whole notion of using skin color as a, as, a, as a mechanism for solving racial problems and racial issues. All right, now I just got found I have another one minute left. I want to get the mother in the audience. You said a wonderful thing. You got the biggest cheer of the show. I want you to stand up. Mm -hmm. You're a light skinned woman. You taught your daughter to have black pride. Will you underscore that? What yes, does I that think mean? the beauty within, and there is so much benefits to being black. I don't think I would want to be anything else right now. We have a natural sense of rhythm. There's beauty. We can cope with any kind of problems. We've shown that we're strong from within. And I think that uh, if she goes on in life with this, that she won't have any problems. And I think that black is beautiful. And I'm very proud to be black right now. Well, I appreciate that. I greatly thank our panel. And we'll come back to wrap things up right after this. I'll be right back. your favorite stars. Don't miss The Dish. <laughs> Who is going to be Time Out's Philadelphian of the Week? Hmm, I wonder. Find out this Friday. Welcome back. You know, a long time ago when I got into the television business and realized that I wanted to uh, do this kind of work, um, a show like today is one of those reasons. I really appreciate everybody's just openness. We could be going on and on and on. The audience is continuing to talk. And I, I think a lot was said on today's show. And I thank everybody for participating so openly. Tomorrow and Friday, Ray and Nancy are going to be here. They're the hosts of Evening Magazine. They're actually going to be holding down the fort for me while I'm out of town in Houston, Texas. Ooh. Tomorrow we're going to feature some of today's top gossips with the latest and the hottest inside scoop uh, on any of your favorite celebrities. Why don't you come down? If you'd like to be in the audience, you can always call us at 238 4940 on Friday. We address <laughs> another interesting question. Should the Northeast secede from the city of Philadelphia? Plus, we'll have our Philadelphia of the Week. And on Friday, we'll also have the winner of the Week for Two at Club Med Paradise Island. What I think is interesting, whoever wins that on Friday has to leave the next day. <laughs> Before the city secedes. We're not eligible for that. <laughs> exactly. And uh, of course, this coming Monday, Monday's uh, Sadie Hawkins Day. That's the one day every four years, allegedly, when a woman can ask a man to marry her. It's one of the reasons I'm going out of town. <laughs> anyway, I thank you very much. I'll miss you for the next couple of days while I'm away. And I hope you got something out of the show. Let's hear from you. All right? Bye-bye. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you.